And I knew at this time that I couldn't drink because the last time I tried to get sober and I drank that that night, I went and got cocaine. I'm like, I once I'm drunk, my I'm like, yeah, cocaine sounds like a great idea. But before I'm drunk, I'm like, no, that stuff ruined my life. I don't want it. Right. Right. So, <laughs> so but I so knowing this, I still had six months sober. I was at a St. Patty's parade. And my and and I hear my my mind's like, you can drink because it's green beer and you never had a problem with green beer. So I literally relapsed drinking because the beer was green and convinced myself that that it would be different and it wouldn't affect me like the other times. And that just spiraled out of control. And uh, I violated my probation with some serious ad charges and I was locked in a jail cell. And that was 10 years ago. 10 years ago, I was looking at, uh, at being habitualized and sent to rock court to face 10 years. And God showed up. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Rooted in Christ podcast. My name is Eric Stevens. I'm the founder of Redwood Christian Ministries. Hope everyone out there is doing well today. With me on the show today is Christian hip-hop recording artist, Brother Bo. Sir, how are you doing tonight? I'm blessed and highly favored, brother. I'm grateful to be here. I feel like we've become best friends in the, like the hour we've already spent. <laughs> I wish I would have hit record 60 minutes ago. <laughs> Yeah. I don't know how often it happens when I'm talking to people. The best conversations always seem to come either before or after the podcast. Like, it's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. So I'm going to give the audience a chance to get to know you the way I already have, not just through your music, but just a little bit about your your journey with Christ, just some of the the the, the trials and tribulations and struggles you had. So any part of your testimony you want to share with the audience, feel free. This is your time. All right, brother. Thank you. My name is Bo. I'm born and raised in South Florida in the Hollywood, uh, Hollywood area, Hollywood, Fort Lauderdale. Grew up, uh, with a good family, a good Christ center family, loving parents and, uh, older brother, two little sisters. And I had a good childhood. I, I, I have no issues with it. Played football and went on pit church picnics. It was a really good childhood. And, uh, but I started to veer off and, and go astray at, at the age of 11. I started getting introduced to marijuana and I started smoking with, uh, with the kids at school. And, and then by the time I was 11 and 13, I'm, I'm already drinking and, and popping pills. And my brother started selling drugs. So I went with him and started selling drugs and wanted to be that cool guy. I was listening to gangster hip hop music and, and watching Scarface. And these are the idols that I had in my life. These are the type of people that I aspired to be like. And, and I just made horrible decisions and it only got worse and worse. By the time I was 15, my mother passed away from breast cancer. And, and I didn't know until I didn't know because the hardest one, the, the last one to see it is the one that's in it. So you come out of, they say, they say hindsight is 2020. And, uh, man, I, when my mom passed away, the drugs and alcohol, all that stuff was like fun and games to me. It was like, but when, but when I, when I got sober 10 years ago and I, and I went through these steps and started really examining my life and trying to see exactly why I do what I do and why, where did these decisions and these type of uh, thought patterns and these type of belief patterns come into play. And, and I realized that at the age of 15, when my mom passed away, it was like a moment where it went from just doing this stuff and hanging out and, and, and playing. It was the solution to the pain in my life from losing my mother. It became my, my uh, my medicine, right? So it was like, this is how I cope with grief. This is how I cope with pain. And then, and really it's a form of idolatry and, and, and trying to be in control because God's the one that's in control. But me wanting to be in control, I thought that drugs, it was, it's all a delusion because I'm like, okay, I don't like the way I feel. I can take this substance and change the way I feel. So I, so I think that I'm in control, but the problem is when I put this drug into me, the drug now has control because now I'm a slave to the drugs. And, and so by the time I was 15 and then my mom passed that, that's when I started, uh, 
started smoking crack. And by the time I was 16, 17, I was doing opiates, oxys. And, and, and by the time I was 18, I started shooting dope with a needle. Uh, I got, I got locked up. And so from 11 to 18, it was all getting high and everything. And then I got locked up and did this, uh, 13 months in like a level 10 boot camp. And in that 13 months, I had to stay sober in there. They were so tight on it. Like I, but I started to get sober. I started lifting weights. I started rapping and I'm like, I wanted, uh, all these different things and like started having goals, started praying and, and trying to uh, reestablish my relationship with God. And it's crazy because I was in there 13 months sober. And the day that they released me and my dad picked me up, the first thing I'm saying in the van is like, hey, dad, you got Percocets? Because when my when my mom passed away, my dad started using the oxys. Because my mom, my mom's like, I'm not taking none of that stuff. Like she went through the cancer, she all the way, she went no pain. And uh, and I and my dad, I didn't know my dad was a heroin addict before I was born. And my dad was able to give up the drugs for that. My mom was going to leave him with my older brother. She said, it's either it's either the drugs or your family. And he started going to church and gave his life to God. And, and he got sober. So when my mom with the with the cancer and all of that stuff, you know, he started to fall off. He started taking her drugs. He relapsed. And. And he was he was there, but he wasn't there, you know. So now my mom's gone. I'm 15. I got a five year old sister and a 10 year old sister. My brother's out doing his own thing. And my dad's there, but he's not there because he's just nodding out all the time. So he may be there physically, but wasn't there spiritually, none of that. So my I thought I thought I got what I always wanted. I always wanted to I, my parents were were tough on me, you know. My parents grounded me all the time. My dad would, my dad would whoop me. He wouldn't abuse me, but he spanked yeah. me, right? Right. He he put the paddle. He put the paddle or the belt on me, right? And yeah. uh, and the moment that that authority was no longer there, like I had no longer anything holding me back or or trying to keep me contained. I just ran a full flood, uh, full fled addict, criminal. It was it was horrible. My house became the party house. Everybody came over because there were no rules there, and uh, and the things just got worse and worse. And anyways, I did that boot camp and I got sober and I was getting high with my dad. And when he picked me up, uh, yeah, the first thing I did was Percocets. And I relapsed and went back to the house. And then I'm thinking, I got maybe if I start a family, if I start a family, this this will man, I gotta do something. Right. And then I have a kid with this girl, and and now I'm shooting dope and and the and that wasn't enough to change me. And now I got this kid and I I, I can't even take care of her. And anyway, it just got worse. My addiction got worse. Her mother did the best thing and left me and took the kid. And at that time I hated her and I hated it and I was resentful and, and I got locked up again. And when I was sitting in the jail, so God started working in my heart. I finally at 18, at 19, I was sitting in a jail cell in the County jail. And I opened up this, these, they give you these little Bibles, these little mini Bibles. And, uh, it has the new Testament. And then in the back, it has Psalms and Proverbs. Right. And this was the first time I picked up the Bible myself to start reading it. And I started reading it. And man, the words of Jesus were just, they were comforting. They were truth. And there was just such revelation. Like I felt alone in that jail cell. But but his comforted me when I was And that's when I started reading it and reading it. And then I got out, and did good for a couple months. and then slowly went right back into my old ways and but i remember in jail cell the hatred that i had towards her was killing me but god exp i was like i can't live with this hatred and god really showed me that it was all my fault he's like what do you expect i'm over there leaving in the middle of the night spending the rent money stealing the car you know and uh, on everything in the house is like what did you expect 
you know, so I called her and made amends and told her I was sorry and, and that I understood why she left and, and that I, you know, I had no, no anger towards her or anything still hurt, you know, mainly because I couldn't forgive myself and I couldn't fix what I've already broken. So I can, I went back into drinking and drugging, ended up going to prison and at work release, I met another girl. She got pregnant, had another kid with another girl, got out of prison and went right back to it, started smoking, started drinking. And it's crazy because it's, it's just, I can't, if I drink, I go and eventually I smoke crack and shoot dope and I get, I can't do any kind of drugs. I, that's me. I can't, there's now, I know people that can have a glass of wine and, and they're fine with that. They won't even finish the whole glass of wine. To me, that made no sense because I don't even like the way alcohol tastes. <laughs> right. So the only reason I was drinking it was for the effect of it. And, and I want more. Right. So I'm like, Anyways, so 10 years ago, you know, I went to prison. I got out, messed up, got locked back up, was on the run a bunch. And uh, in this time, I'm always rapping. I got these dreams of being a, a rapper and this stuff and writing all these songs. And God started getting at my heart. I lost my 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 second daughter uh, to a child and her her mom got hospitalized while I was in jail. They hit me with child abandonment and neglect. And wow. then, uh, yeah, they took her. And then I get out. I'm like, man, I got to get right and try to get my daughter. And so I got out and I started trying to get into sobriety and stuff and got at some recovery house. And uh, I did good for like six months. And I knew at this time that I couldn't drink because the last time I tried to get sober and I drank, that that night I went and got cocaine. I'm like, I once I'm drunk, my I'm like, yeah, cocaine sounds like a great idea. But before I'm drunk, I'm like, no, that stuff ruined my life. I don't want it. Right. Right. So, <laughs> so but I so knowing this, I still had six months sober. I was at a St. Patty's parade. And my and and I hear my my mind's like, you can drink because it's green beer and you never had a problem with green beer. So I literally relapsed drinking because the beer was green and convinced myself that that it would be different and it wouldn't affect me like the other times and that just spiraled out of control and uh i violated my probation with some serious ad charges and i was locked in a jail cell and that was 10 years ago 10 years ago i was looking at uh at being habitualized and sent to rock court to face 10 years and god showed up and this is where this is where this is where God does what God does and only he can do. And, and I'm still, I'm just so grateful. I'm grateful for his mercy. Right. So I'm sitting in a jail. They, they weren't even going to let me out, but the, the charges got filed as a petty theft. Mm. So the judge, when I went in the hearing for my probation was able to reinstate it. And then he looks down at it as he's reinstating me and sending me to this place called JC's recovery house. He goes, Mr. Grossnickel, this case here, th he goes, the, the paper here says it's that it was $600 and, and that's more than petty theft. That's grand theft. He goes, you know, if they overturn this and make it a grand theft, I'll have to bring you back here in front of the court and I can habitualize you and send you to rock court and give you 10 years because this will be th your third separate offense of grand theft. And I said, yes, I understand that your honor. And he goes, okay. And, uh, and he let me out. I went to this recovery place and my first night there now, now this was two, now I was in jail for 20 days on that violation and I was sitting in that jail cell and I was just like, man, I really didn't want to live. And this again, I just don't want to live because my life is just, Oh, I'm just hopeless. Like, this is my life. This is just, this is it. Like jails, institutions, and death. And, and while I'm outside in the streets, it ain't nothing but bondage to drugs and alcohol. Like it, the insanity, I can't be, wow. I can't have, I can't have a good family. I can't be a good father. I can't be a good father to my daughters. I can't, I can't just be happy with working a job, a nine to five and doing the right thing. That, that my mind doesn't work like that. No matter how many times I've tried, eventually I end up back out here in the streets abandoning my kids, abandoning my family, abandoning everybody to live 
according to my flesh and 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 be a slave to these drugs and, and to act like a criminal and to live as a criminal. And I was just so hopeless, man. I was crying out in that jail cell and I'm looking at 10 years. I'm like, Lord, please get me out of here. I don't want to be in here. And that's, that's what sucks the most is when you're sitting in there, you don't know when you get now. And then the fact that it got put as a petty theft, that was all a, 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 a blessing to me because if that didn't get put to a petty theft, the judge would have handled that right there and wouldn't have reinstated me. And that's what he was saying. He's like, I can't, your new charge, I can't even handle it in this courtroom because it's a misdemeanor case. This is felony court. And that's when he was like, look, if they overturn this and bring this back in front of me, I can, then I can habitualize you. So I'm at this JC's recovery house, man. I get out, they pick me up on Thanksgiving day. I'm there. And this is where I'm sitting in the chair. They're having this meeting at night. I'm I'm full of gratitude at the moment because we just had a big dinner. And, and then all of a sudden I'm sitting there and they're talking. All of a sudden, my mind, my mind starts running. Then I hear, it doesn't matter how much you know about drugs and alcohol and and, and what you learn and, and your knowledge of this and what it does to your life because that's not enough to keep you sober because you've known this stuff yet you've continued to make the same horrible decisions. All of a sudden fear starts setting in. Then then that voice says, these consequences, this 10 years over your head, that ain't enough to keep you sober mm. because I just previously had five years hanging over my head before I went to prison, when I was on probation, I got out on probation. The judge said, I'm giving you five years probation. If you violate, I'm sending you to prison for five years. And yet I'm like, okay, and but I'm in a crack house the night, the day before probation. And then I fail the drug test. I get violated. So I'm like, this 10, this consequences ain't enough to keep you sober. Now I'm more scared. Because these are the things that I'm thinking that are that are okay. I got this. This is my safeguards, right? I'm being I'm being convinced that that God's convincing me that I'm hopeless in this moment. And then all of a sudden, I hear the voice say, "Knowing that Jesus is the answer ain't enough." And then I'm like, all of a sudden, right in front of my eyes, like it starts flashing before my eyes all the moments in my life where I was homeless on the side of buildings in abandoned apartments, in the back of the cop cars, in the jail cells, all the moments of my life where I was always crying out. There was these moments where I was just so desperate. to I didn't want to live and I wanted to change, but I couldn't change me. I tried and I failed. And like, I'm back in this situation again, because there were so many times where I'm like, I'm never going to do that again. I'm never going to be like that. And I'm never going to go that way again. I'm going to change my life. And yet I would end up back into that place and then crying out going, God, why haven't you changed me? God, why is it? Why am I still this way? Why am I still going through this? And in that moment, all those moments were flashing in front of my eyes. And then all the fear that was consuming me left and a peace came upon me, which I know now is the Holy Spirit, which is God just rested his Holy Spirit upon me. Mm. And I heard in that still small whisper, he's like, I've been preparing you. I'm going to use you. Now just be still and follow me. And, and from that moment I learned is like, I don't, I can't trust my own thinking because at any moment I could have six months, I could have a year. And at any moment I can have a thought of using or drinking and I'll fall for it. Like I was convinced that I could drink because the beer was green. If I fell for that, then there's, there's more schemes out there that I'll easily fall for. If I'm that dumb, I could be that dumb again. So in that moment, I, I, I no longer was, I still am not dependent upon those wisdom. I don't lean on my own understanding today. I, I, you know, I'm so completely dependent upon the Holy Spirit and the voice of truth because his word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I, man, the word of God is so powerful. Like just reading in those words and it's like the wicked stumble and don't know what caught they, they stumble in the dark and no don't they don't know what causes them to stumble. I'm like, that's me. I I keep falling down, I keep messing, I keep ending up and, and I don't really even know how I get here. How did I get here again? How did I get here again? That's me. And that's because I was living my life based according to my thoughts and my feelings, making decisions based on my own feelings and my own thoughts. 
And now today I know, man, beyond a, a beyond a reasonable doubt, a hundred percent that my thoughts and my feelings are not stable foundations to make to make decisions in my life. That that only God, I need his counsel. I keep godly counsel in my life. Now that and 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 that's it from then on. Man, the very next day I walked out of the gate after this great spiritual experience, right? So those experiences ain't enough. Even that experience, that experience ain't enough. It's the spirit of God. It's not by my strength. It's not by might nor power, but by his spirit. It is only by his spirit that I can walk in any kind of obedience that I can even do anything, right? So the very next day, I'm walking out of the gates at this halfway house after having that great experience. And all of a sudden, here comes the enemy. He's on full-fledged attack. The thoughts start raging in my mind. I hear, you ain't, you, you, you ain't even a father to your children. You owe $1,000 a month in child support. You can't even pay your probation fees. You got this felony charge. They're going to overturn it and you're probably going to prison anyway. You ain't even got, all you got is a garbage bag of clothes. You don't have a license. You don't have a car. And once you pay your rent and your child support take garnishes your wages, you're left with $35 a week. You'll never be able to save up to get a car. You'll never be able to save up to get a license. You'll never be able to drive around and pick up your kids. You'll never be, a, you'll never be able to get your own place. You'll never be a father to your children. Man, I was just, he just beating me down. And I was just, I felt like this hole was just getting so, like it was a grave. Like it felt like my problems were just too big for me to cr climb out. And then here comes this thought. But if you sell your, if you go get your prescriptions and sell your drugs and sell you, you sell those prescriptions, that's $2,000 right there a month right there. You need that now. That's how you could do it. And then thank God. Thank you, God. Thank you, Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit intervened in that moment and started questioning me. Mm -hmm. He says, Bo, what happens when you sell drugs? Well, I, I can't sell drugs and not use them. Then what happens? Well, then I don't go to sleep on time because I'm up all night. And then I don't go into work because I ain't slept because I was doing high rise window cleaning. Right. So I'm like, if I don't sleep right, I'm not trying to go hang on a building out in the sun. Right. <laughs> right. Right. So I'm like, well, I don't go to work and I call out or I just no call, no show and I lose my job. Then what happens? Then I start using more drugs than I sell. Then what happens? Then I start robbing and stealing to feed the habit. Then what happens? Then I get caught like I do every single time. Then what? Then I'm standing right where I'm at looking at this. And if I catch another charge, I'm definitely hopeless. I'm right. definitely going away. My And I started crying in that moment because I felt, I realized that my only solution that I could see, see, I could see it, it's, it, was a, it was a delusion because I seen how to get the money. to. I thought this money is what I needed to handle these problems. And I saw a way that I could do it, but there was a, so the only way that I seen God exposed it, that it was no way. It was just a trap. It was a trap door. It wasn't a door out of this hole. It was a trap door to bring me even further, deeper into it. And in that moment, man, I just looked up with the tears just pouring out of my eyes. And I'm like, God, I don't know how you're going to do this, but I look forward to seeing how you do it. And just one day at a time, doing my best to seek God and walk with him. That very, that, <laughs> that very next day after that, I'm at work. and. And the boss brings me to this building and I just started this job. And this boss brings me to this building. He brings me up to the roof and he's like, hey, all right, I'm going to leave you here and I'll pick you up at the end of the day. And he left. And what I used to do is when my my old behaviors was we would go to jobs like that. And in the morning we would go sleep in the staircase and get a couple hours pay for for napping. And I'm like, all of a sudden he left and it's like seven in the morning. My, my I hear these voices going. Oh man, I'm finna go. I'm I'm still a little tired. I can go lay down in the in the staircase and take a nap. And then I hear another voice. You you want you want to be who you've always been? You want to lie? You want to steal? You want to cheat? You want to manipulate your boss? 
And I started and I got convicted right there. And I was like, no, Lord, I just want to live right before your eyes. And I grabbed and I picked up my ropes and, and my chair and just started setting it up. And I went and I worked hard that day. And then and then a boss came and picked me up at the end of the day. He was taking me home and he grabbed me something to eat and gave me a hundred dollar bill and was like, he's like, he was like, good work today, man. Thank you for working hard. And God was just showing me, he's like, I got you. I got you. If you just do what is right and walk with me, I got a, I got a path laid out for you and I'm going to take care of you and I'm going to provide for you. And six months later, that same boss, God puts it on his heart and he comes up to me. He's like, look, I want to pay for your license. I'm going to pay for your license. And in this work truck, this is going to be your truck. You can use it for going to your meetings. You can use it for picking up your daughters on visitation and going to the gym. As long as you work with me, this is your truck. And man, another time, that's when I just started breaking down. I'm like, God, <laughs> you had a plan the whole time. And six months ago, I was ready to go sell drugs again because I thought that was the only way I was going to be able to get a license and get a, and get a, and get a car, a vehicle to be able to go see my kids and stuff and not have to ride the bus and everything, be able to take them somewhere to the park or something like that. And, and God, he truly is Jehovah Jireh. He definitely provides. He is the provider. And it's just, it's just been nonstop like that. You know, anything that I need every, he made a way and he still does that today. You know, it does. I don't, the enemy wants us to compromise. The enemy wants us to take a shortcut. He wants us to take shortcut cuts. He wants us to cut corners because God doesn't like that stuff. You know, that's not the way of God. And he wants us to, to settle, which is that that song church is really all about when I said, cause you can't sell your soul because it don't belong to you anyways. Right. But it's an, but it's a, it's a phrase of, of saying like, People are selling like they sell their soul for this Porsche, right? So you go out and you do wrong. Nothing wrong with having a Porsche. If you if got if you work hard and 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 you get blessed and you got a Porsche, awesome. But to sell your soul to compromise and to do wrong to get it, to compromise those that moral, because God put his moral law in all of our hearts. But to 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 sear my conscience towards him, to to disconnect from the Holy Spirit and do what I want to do to get what I want to get and cut these corners. I found that the only way that I can live sober is by being rigorously honest in all areas of my life, get with the pastor and, and confess in areas where I fall short and, and asking for prayer and asking for help and not trying to put on a mask and not try to present myself to be someone I'm not. And, and just, and, and then stay on my knees before God asking them for strength and help, you know, and, uh, yeah, so to compromise and to sell drugs and to lie here and to cheat here, to get this, those, those behaviors and those paths always lead. Right. So that's what that song church is really all about going out and selling drugs and, and doing these things or going around sleeping with all these women. Cause we're trying to, God created and, and has all these things, certain things for us, but we take them and pervert them. And we want them when we want them. I want them now. Right? And then, and then also comes the the pervertedness and the and the and that and that flesh that just wants more, right? never satisfied, never content. Right. And I'm just grateful. I'm grateful for contentment. You know, I'm grateful for peace and contentment. Yeah. But also, I want to share through that process. What, like I told you earlier, because I remember how powerful this was and. My pastor told me that I need, I need to keep telling people about it. So when I was struggling in my sobriety, right, in my sobriety, struggling with lust and struggling with these things and continuing to try, continuing to try and then fail and hear the voice of the this voice telling me that I'll never get it and to just stop trying. Don't even don't even try to pursue holiness. Don't even try God's way anymore. You'll never be good enough. You can't be a good Christian, right? But so falling short, being filled with shame and guilt. I remember I was being filled with shame and guilt. And then, and just feeling like I just wanted to run away. And 
and then hearing all of the, the, the accusations. Now I got these feelings of shame and guilt. And now I'm hearing these voices telling me that I can't go to God, you know, because in the moment I'm like, I, I'm trying to resist on my own. And then it comes to the point where I'm just like, he'll forgive me. And then the hearing that voice saying, you just used his mercy as an excuse to act out in your sin. <laughs> he ain't going to forgive you, you know, but then hearing the word of God that aligns with his word that says, whoever confesses their sins, mm. he's faithful to forgive us from all unrighteousness and make us right with him, make us right with him. He is in the light. Whoever walks in the light and abides in him. I need, there's dark, there's dark things in me. There's, there's sinful, there's sinfulness in my heart. Still there's areas in my heart that I'm completely surrendered. I need help. And my solution ain't to run away, but to run to the great physician, to run to him and present it to him. And I remember, man, I went in there and I fell down and I just started crying on my God. I just used your mercy as an excuse to indulge and to satisfy my, my flesh. Because in that moment, I was so full of self-hatred and, and self-condemnation. And, and I was just like, you still love me. And in that moment, the shame left, the guilt left, all of that stuff was removed. And I felt his love come upon me. I felt the weight of his love just just hold me. And I heard that still small whisper that, that wasn't condemning me anymore, but said, yes, I love you, son. And that just broke me. It's like, how? How can you still love me? How? And it's just like, God's just trying to, his love is not like my love. Like his, he's not like me. And for so long, I would always try to, compare him to how I respond and act to things. And, and God was just trying to show me how much bigger he is and really, and how powerless I am. Right? And through these processes of, of powerlessness and coming into these uh, revelations of that, man, it's only by God. It's only by his spirit and his power. So that for the rest of my days, I bow will tell everyone I encounter, I'm not going to say, hey, I overcame drugs and alcohol. Hey, I quit smoking cigarettes. Hey, I stopped running around sleeping with women. No, I tried and I failed and I tried and I failed and God's delivered me. It's all him. It's all the power of Jesus Christ. So it doesn't matter where anybody's at. It doesn't matter how long they've been stuck in it. It doesn't matter what they've done or what they got going on right now. There is no depth that he won't go, and there's no sin that outweighs the love of God, right? So God, he's after our hearts. Of course, it's not a motive where it's not this, this false, uh, false gospel where Christ died, so now I'm free to sin. That's not, no, Christ died to set me free from sin. There's freedom and deliverance, and it's only in him. It's not a freedom to indulge in it. It's a freedom from it that, that that sets us free. And man, it was I was I was watching this uh this documentary and the pastor I God gave me this great revelation. This pastor was like, I used to preach to my congregation, try to tell them to stop sinning. And then he's like, but I realized that 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 I had it all wrong. They keep doing what they want to do. And he's like, so now I, I try to preach to convince them that they sin because they love them. And the only thing that's going to overcome that is a greater love. So, and that's what God used on me. It's, it's, it's his love that overcomes. He who is forgiven much loves much, right? So the more that I fought and God takes what the enemy intends for destruction and turns around and uses it for good. The enemy intended my sins to destroy me. But what they did is they brought me on my knees before a holy, righteous God who is rich in mercy and love and who has washed away my sins. And he's used it to lavish me with his love and his love 
just continues to pour in me and it says, we love him because he first loved us. So the more I experience his love, the more my love for him grows. And the more my love for him grows, it outgrows the loves of this, of this sinful flesh. So it's the love of God in me producing a, a victory, right? So it's, it's overcoming by the love of God. And man, it was so powerful when I realized that I was like, wow. God, it's all your love. You love and it and it helped me because I remember there was times where I would be, I would start to become like kind of like self-righteous areas when I would start doing good. We'd be in gruesome and I'd be like, why are you doing that? You gotta stop doing that like this. Now I, I learned my lesson. I learned my, I don't tell nobody. All I, I just point them to Christ and point them towards his love. And like, look, man, God hates sin. God hates sin and sin's gonna make you. And if we partake in sin, we will reap. If we if we plant seeds of sin, we are gonna reap death. But that's not what God wants in our life. And then, and and God can uproot that stuff. And He loves you just where you're at. You don't have to clean yourself up to come to Him. He says, just come as you are, and He's gonna do the cleaning Himself. Right. So I don't want to be the type of person that beats the sheep or shuns people away from God. I want to point them towards Christ. Your sin will either have you, your sin will have, the enemy will t play you on your sin and have you running from God because of it. Or if you understand God's mercy, your sin will drive you closer to him to encounter that cross where, where the self-life dies, where it's like, I don't trust me. I, man, I don't trust me at all, but I trust God. I trust the Holy Spirit living in me. I trust his voice. I don't trust any. I don't trust anything about my flesh and my sinful nature, but I trust the Holy Spirit. And I'm grateful that today that that I have him dwelling within me and that, you know, I can be dependent upon him. This is um, one. Thank you so much for for sharing your testimony, your transparency. And one of the things like we didn't we didn't talk about this before we got on, but like hearing this now and I'm hearing it for the second time, like what's in my head right now is old ways will not open new doors. Like if you want a different result, we are going to have to do something differently. Mm. And anytime, especially we as Christians, we are trying to do anything. We need to put the word of God with it. We need to, we need to couple everything we're doing with prayer and with the word of God, because I can cast out a demon. Somebody can cast a demon out of me, but if I don't put the word of God behind that, I'm going right back to those demons and they might bring seven mm -hmm. more of their friends. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So it's like, I need to have the full understanding because stopping the behavior is never enough. Mm -hmm. And I had, you know, I struggle with addiction myself, like very similar to, to you. I stopping the behavior was never enough. I had to change the heart condition. I had to get to the real why of why am I doing what I'm doing? Why am I constantly going back to my own vomit, just like the Bible says? Why am I constantly regurgitating something that I know is making me sick, and I'm going to go back to it, take in the vomit now, and get sick all over again? Mm. So what? what is it? It's because I don't have a full understanding of what this sin is doing, how God views sin. I don't have the, the godly view of sin, and I need to put something else in its place. Prayer fasting the word of god and i need to put in some new some new habits because something has me in bondage and whatever has me in bondage i can't resist it because i'm already trapped i'm already in said bondage therefore i've already crossed the blood of christ. i've already crossed that line of the blood of christ i'm now in enemy territory and we as christians need to not think that we can take on the enemy jesus mm. did that we won because Jesus won. It wasn't because Eric Stevens fought that fight. I needed so I needed a savior. I needed someone to come in and save me. Because without someone coming in and saving me, I have my own nine millimeter in my head and I'm actually pulling the trigger and you and I are not having this conversation right now. Like it's in game right in and there. Yeah. So when something has you in bondage, you then have to said, get out of bondage. You need to, maybe you need to, well, we know you need to pray. We need to repent, turn away from and then we actually need to figure out, and that once we repent and turn away from, then we need to, okay, Jesus, help me. Okay, I cannot go back in this bear trap. I cannot go back in this very thing that has me in bondage. Help me. 
So for me now, I don't even go to bars anymore. Mm. Like I, and if a, if there's a, a restaurant that I like that I know that there's a bar in it, I said, I'll order take it. I'll order it to go. Oh, pick it up and leave. Like I won't even sit in there. I don't, you know, we're tempted away by our own sinful desires. I don't have a desire to drink anymore, but I'm not even given the chance because I know when I start drinking, it starts with just one. And then before you know it, a few weeks go by and the bottle's now gone. So let's not even chance it. Let's not even trust myself. So wherever my sin is, I'm going to make sure I'm like three football fields away from it <laughs> because let's not even get close to it to mm-hmm. find out how strong I'm not. We've already been down this road. <laughs> <laughs> Old ways won't open new doors. I've learned that when I trusted my own strength, I screwed it up. So let's not play this game again. Let's just mm-hmm. be adults and let's just move on. And I, I really hope that blesses somebody to understand that if something has you in bondage already, you can't resist it. You're already trapped. We got to get out of bondage and we got to do something differently than what got us in bondage in the first place. Mm. Amen. So, man, Amen. I don't believe, we, I don't even believe we haven't touched on any of your music like at all. Yeah. <laughs> like we well, you know, it's crazy. Song. We talked about you one were talking. Song. <laughs> I know. I was thinking, I was thinking too, because my previous re- uh, attempt at recovery, God was trying to get the music from me. And I didn't want to give it up. And I was like, nah, especially because I rapped and I wrote these songs that I felt like this is my life and these are things that I've been through. And I and I couldn't see. And then, but this time around, when I was in that jail cell before I got to JC's house, I was like, he I was wrestling with it again. And he's like, I'm like, but I but I wrote these songs and they're about my life and, and the things I've been through. And this and he's like, that's not who you are. Right. That's not who you are. And man, I, I finally, I just surrendered. I gave it up. I stopped listening to it. And I started listening to worship music because when I got out, I, I drowned in myself in worship because it set, in my, it set my mind on him in the way, because music alters your mood. Yes, it Music does. will influence you and it will alter your mood. Whether they try to say it doesn't, it does. It all you you could listen to a sad song. It could make you think about old relationships, make you sad, make you cry. You could think about... It will alter your mood and it will influence you. So I'm like, all I want to do is listen to worship music because it's making me feel so grateful because it's setting my mind on gratitude and God saved me. And like, I was just headed here and I, and I'm feeling hopeless, but now I have hope. I want music that makes me feel hopeful. I want music that makes me feel grateful. I want to be thankful. I want to be joyous. I want to feel free. And that's what worship does for me. As I worship God, he inhabits the praises of his people. His presence is just so more tangible. So I'm wanting to listen to this. And I listen to all rap music. I gave up all the songs I wrote and, and, and left it alone. And like, I still work at the place where I got sober. Mm. So I don't hang on buildings and clean windows no more. You, you're giving your life to Christ. You're giving your life to Christ. Who, who you vote for? Oh, I vote for Trump. I was like, all right, would you wear a Biden shirt? No. Why not? Because I don't support him. Okay, so why are you wearing these shirts that are that filled up with drugs and money? Why are you listening to music that promotes uh, sexual immorality, that promotes murder and promotes drugs? If these are the things, and you're listening to this song and you're bopping your head, yes, you're. I'm in agreement. I'm in agreement. I'm in agreement. And then wondering why these things keep producing bad fruit in your life and 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 knowing that lucifer himself was it when it describes him it says he has instruments built into his being like we have arms and legs he got instruments right and he was a and he was like a leader in worship and then one and a third of the angels were full with him and and, and and left with him so it's like one of his greatest weapons that he uses is music these are one of his things that he influences here in and that was the thing. I was like, I didn't even want to listen to rap. I was like, I even listened to a cut. I tried to listen to a couple of Christian. I, somebody was like, here, listen to this. And I, and to me, it sounded like the same thing. It was like, me, 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 I'm going to be this. I'm top dog Jesus. And then it was just like, you know what? I don't want to hear none of that. I'm just right. listening to worship. Yeah. And then about, and then about uh, four, five years ago, someone let me hear a, a, a song by Brian Trail. Somebody put on one of his songs and it and God used it. He ministered through that song and convicted me in an area of my life and made me want to draw closer to God. And I was like, God, if I ever rap, 
I want to make songs that draw people close to you. I want to draw, I want to make songs, Lord, that glorify your name, Lord, exposes sin and calls it for what it is and encourages men of God to stand up, women of God to stand up for what is right and what is true and to, and to just change that whole, that whole uh, stronghold, that whole way of thinking that these bad things are cool, like, and acceptable, that sin is cool and acceptable. No, it's not. It's it's a lie and it's death. Sin produces death. This isn't cool. Death isn't cool. It's not acceptable. So so just to call those things out and 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 to be able to stand for. It. I went hard. I went I went hard for for <laughs> I went for hard on that end when I was running with the devil. I went hard. So why not go hard for Christ? And so that's when and God started giving me new songs, and I just started. And I was like, you know what? Let me. And then in the place where I'm at, uh, God opened up all the doors because I didn't have no finances or nothing. And then blessed me with this guy down the street who records mixes and masters for twenty dollars an hour. Like who who does that? Right, God, right, <laughs> right. Who? So it's, it was just a blessing. And then someone came in and showed me where they lease their beats. It was just God lined it all up, and I made some songs. And everybody in the com- community and and then people in recovery liking it. So I was like, you know what? Lord, just put this out there and see what you do with it. So, and in the past past two years, God's just opened up some crazy doors and just uh, there's been I've been uh, been all the way up to Oregon. They had me come out to Oregon, and really we like to hit the streets, right? So yeah. we'll go out whether, wherever they get us. I don't mind. We'll, we'll go onto the streets. We'll grab the speaker box, go out there and start rapping. We go to the hoods. We went to Chicago. We went to a church in Chicago and we're like, where's the hood at? <laughs> All right, go to South uh South Side and O Block. We went there with a bunch of us and we're like, you know what, we're just gonna go out there and pray for people. You know, I used to go, listen, I went I went to Maryland, I ran to Maryland, I ran to Georgia, and I ran to Alabama trying to get sober and trying to get away from drugs and get away from all the people, places and things because they're the problem. And, and I need to change my life. But everywhere I went there, I was And character attracts character and the dirty devil knows how to lie and whisper thoughts in my head to lead me right back into the trap. And I thought I was so slick and so clever only to find out I was the fool returning to his vomit. Right. So but now, right, so I went in all these different places and, and continued the insanity of it. But now I was I would get to these neighborhoods. I was in Baltimore and went into the hood and I was like, I'll just start rapping. I'd be like, uh, yeah, no, I'm cool. I'll start rapping. So, I mean, if I did that for the wrong thing, why not do it for the right thing? You know, bro, no joke. That's why before I make any move. Like, and I mean, where there's a new job, where there is, I'm about to buy a new house, no matter what I'm, I ask God, what do you want me to do? And where do you want me to go to make sure I'm not just running from myself? Cause eventually I'm going to catch up with me. Mm. Like you, you nailed it. Like that's because I have ran and then ran back into me just in a different mm. city with a different drug dealer. Like, it's just, it's crazy. Like in a different bar, whatever scenario you want to plug, plug in there, like you nailed it. Like it is, that is why I always ask God, is this move of you or am I running from something that you are trying to teach me? Or am I running from myself? Like you nailed it. Mm-hmm. And it's funny. Cause I believe you because one of the guys that when I was in new Orleans, who I was, who I was going out, cause we, we did the evangelism, um, missions trip there. One of those guys knows you. And he was yeah. like, you got to reach out to him for your podcast. And I'm like, he doesn't know me. He's like, but I know him. I said, good, make that happen. <laughs> yeah. But just to tell people your heart, like he gave me your number. I text you and you hit me back up like within the hour. Like, so I appreciate it, man. I really do. You know, yeah, and bro. something else that, you know, you said something else too about like, it's almost like putting off and, and putting on, like I've been blessed that a lot of the people I've had on this podcast have been my favorite artists. You know, I'm like, y'all don't, you don't understand. Like I was growing up listening to, to DMX and Tupac and Eminem and, and the locks Mm -hmm. and like, like, it's crazy because so then I get saved and I go to church and I'm like, you want me to listen to hill songs and elevation? Like I'm not (laughs) knocking them, but I grew up in an era of rap 
where like the lyricists were can you're talking about like nas and biggie and it didn't yeah whether they, whether they live in a life or not at the time was not the point <laughs> like they, yeah, I, was, yeah. I was i was in bondage is the point <laughs> yeah so the the point is is like i need to find something to replace this with so like when i and i'm just gonna i always i mentioned him on this podcast because like k diamond did the music for this podcast but like when i came across him and breno it was like this is now giving me especially the point in my life where i discovered their music I was like, this is really giving me something else to listen to besides the poison I've been listening to my entire life. And it's, you know, and it, there's so much of it out there that, you know, you don't have to go back to it. So. Amen. And it's crazy. And I just had uh ASAP preach on there and I always love when you two team up. Cause I know it's about to be some hard. Like I just, yeah. I wait for it. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He just sent me another one that goes so tough. I was like, yo, that thing's so tough. I bet he did. I bet he yeah. did. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I love him, man. I, that he's he's been a, another brother in my life that that God has blessed me with. That's yeah. sincere, man. You know what? That's that's real. Isn't you know and 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 always ones isn't trying to be at the top, just trying to like lift everybody up, man. And uh, yeah, I I got to go out there and meet his family and everything. I love his family, his kids. And he just, you know, he's got a heart. He just wants to be more like Jesus and lead more, more people to Jesus, man. So that's where it's at, man. Yeah. Brother, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. I feel like I can talk over the two hours, but I want to be respectful of your time. So this brings us to the final segment of the podcast. This is the let them know segment of the show. This is where you can share anything you like with the audience. So brother Bo, please let them know. Look, man, wherever you're at, whatever you're going through, whatever you got going on, God loves you, man. He loves you with all of his heart. And it says where sin abounds, grace abounds more, meaning that there's no depth that you could go that God's love can't reach you. And there's no amount of sin or things that you've done that God can't wipe clean because His that precious blood of Jesus Christ is greater than all the sins of the world. So he just wants your heart. He just wants you to draw near to him. He wants a relationship with you. It's not about following rules and doing all these things. He wants you to walk hand in hand with him like they did, like, like they did in the garden in the cool of the day. See, the Lord Jesus has torn that veil and restored relationship. It's no longer the letter, but we're, 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 we're no longer under the letter. We're under the spirit of God. And uh, man, it's such a blessing. And it's such an honor to be able to to share with y'all what God's done in my life. And uh, yeah, man, check out the music, Brother Bo Music. You can find it on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, iTunes. And uh, yeah, man, it's just been a blessing to make music that that honors God and and uh, what He's done, man. He's <laughs> He baffles me. They used to in the in the program they say the down, drugs and alcohol is baffling. No man, listen. You haven't encountered the love of God because that's baffling. Yeah. The fact that he still loves me after everything. So just uh, I want you to find your identity in the love of Christ, not what your mind tells you, not your own understanding, not and get built into a church. I really I highly, highly encourage that get built into a Bible, uh, a Bible, believe in read in church and get built into the body of Christ because we are the church. We are the members. We come together as each other and keep each other accountable and uh, encourage each other to continue in the faith. So if anything, that's all I want to give y'all, man. Man, thank you so much. Would you mind close us out in prayer before we get out of here? Absolutely. Well, dear Heavenly Father, we just want to acknowledge your presence, creator of the universe. Lord, you spoke everything into existence. You're all powerful. You're so mighty. And I'm so grateful that you, the most powerful being, the Alpha and the Omega, the eternal God, that you are good, you are kind, and you are merciful. And Lord, I thank you that we're, we're objects of your mercy and not your wrath. So, Lord, I just ask for your blessing over my brother's life, Lord. I, I pray for your blessing over the podcast, Lord, and every podcast that he does, Lord, that you just continue to use these to reach the eyes, Lord, and the ears of those out there, Lord, that are searching for you. 
Lord, I pray over everyone that is listening and everybody that has heard this, Lord. I just pray, Lord, that you continue to work in their hearts, Father God, that they just come closer to you. They hit their knees, Lord, and, and, and make a commitment, Lord, a commitment that says, Father, I need you and I want to follow you. So, Lord, I just pray your blessing over this. And I just give you thanks and honor and glory because you're worthy of it all, Lord. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. And Lord, I thank you for, for my brother right now. I thank you for his yes. I thank you for his obedience. I thank you for his heart and his passion for you, Father. I pray that you just continue to use his testimony to just break bondage in other people, to, to, to just help set people free, to help to help break just the chains on others, Lord, not for his glory, his praise or his honor, but for yours, Father God. Lord, our lives are surrendered to you. So I just pray that we continue to carry our cross daily, that we don't grow weary in, in doing good, that we just continue to just seek first the kingdom of God and lean not on our own understanding, Lord. I pray you just continue to surround my brother and I with just, just mighty men and women of God just to hold us accountable and just to, to help keep us on the straight and narrow, Father. And Lord, I just thank you for now in advance for his expanded territory. I thank you that you just continue to guide his hands as he, as he writes, as he records, um, and just continue to open up doors for him. And I thank you for the divine appointments that you set before him now, Father. Lord, I pray your traveling mercies we depart, and I pray for just a peaceful rest over us both. We just pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus' name. Amen, brother. Brother, thank you so much for doing the show. If you are enjoying our content and you are enjoying the Rooted in Christ podcast, please like, follow, share, and subscribe. It really helps us uh, get the word of Jesus out there. It helps with the algorithm. Please, brother, thank you so much for, for doing the show. And we're going to share all of your links as well. So they're going to be able to get a hold of you. So, Absolutely. Eric, I love you, brother. And we can do this again. We'll set up another time to do it again. No. So we can go in more, you know? Let's do it, man. We, you, you ain't that far away. You might just catch me in Florida sooner rather than later. <laughs> All right. Come down here during Rolling Loud so we oh, can go hit the streets. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now you're talking my language. Now you're yeah. talking my language. Those are the two. Uh, Ultra and Rolling Loud are like the two big events they have down here in Miami that I love uh, going out and witnessing to. Man, yeah. I'm down. You can make it down for one of those. We'll we'll hit that. We'll hit the streets out there. Give me the dates. I'm down to win some souls for Jesus. Definitely down to do that. Let's do that. Amen, brother. Brother, thank you so much for doing the show. We will definitely make this happen again. Sounds good, brother. Love you guys. <laughs> <laughs>